Good morning, church, and welcome. Whether you're here in person at 305 or online with us, we hope you feel welcome this morning. Um, things look very different here in person um, and a bit different online. Let me give you the reason why. Um, early this week, one of our staff members found that he had been exposed to a positive case of COVID and then started showing symptoms pretty soon after. Um, and before knowing, all of our staff had been working together in the office, so for precautionary sake, we um, went to a video-driven service this week. So far, two of the staff members have tested positive and um, just wanna keep them safe and keep us safe. So um, this morning, we'll be hearing from a different speaker, excuse me, Steve Pattison, Randy's study partner, um, will be speaking to us this morning via video. And um, our regular worship team, uh, we have a little blast from the past and some worship brought back to us. So um, I hope you enjoy. If you don't mind, if you'd bow with me so we could pray before we start. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. Father, um, right now I lift our staff up to you, those who are dealing with COVID, and Father, those who are antsy at home trying to... Um, to work remotely, make sure we're taken care of while they can't even be here. Father, I thank you for Steve. Thank you for his willingness to step in um, so that we can have some continuity and feel like we've not missed a beat. Father, I pray that our worship this morning, whether we're in person here at 305 or we're at a different location, if we're in our living room in our pajamas, Father, let it be holy and pleasing to you. Father, um, despite our circumstances, we praise you. We praise you, and um, we love you. It's in your name. Amen.
school career I got together with some of my best friends from school and we went to uh, Texas Roadhouse and it was like our last big meal together um, before we all went off to different colleges and things like that and uh, I would tell you right now that if I had said something similar to Jesus when he was at uh, his last meal with his best friends before crucifixion if I would have said something like hey guys this bread that we're eating and this drink that we're drinking is going to represent my blood and my body my friends would have like been what are you talking about They would have thought I was crazy. I can imagine that that's what Jesus' best friends, his disciples, his followers, I imagine that that was what their response was like. When he took the cup and the bread and said, this is my body and this is my blood that's going to be broken and shed for you. I imagine that they had no idea what he was talking about. When we read that story, we, we read it from the lens of knowing the end of the story and knowing what Jesus did for us and knowing um, that he got up on a cross and defeated death, but they didn't have a clue about any of that. And yet they broke the bread with him and they vowed to, every time they do that, remember him. We get to know the end of the story and we get to know that this was the ultimate sacrifice, the greatest moment in human history when Jesus got up on that cross for us and when he rose again in three days. So every week here at Church Anywhere, we take time to remember what Jesus did for us. We take time to take the elements, the cup and the bread, and spend time remembering his sacrifice. So right now what's going to happen is there's going to be just a little thing on the screen that uh, is some scripture, and there's going to be some music playing in the background. And while that's happening, go ahead and take time and remember what Jesus did for us, and let's take communion together.
between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is risen Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could find such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and wear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings called me his own Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave had no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to break.
Hey guys, glad you're here. I'm glad you guys are uh, who are joining us online or joining us in that fashion. You might have noticed I am not Randy Kirk. I'm actually Steve. I'm his much better looking study partner. Randy asked me to preach for you this morning and I think he does that periodically just so that you know how good you have it from week to week. Now, let's start out this morning by just playing a little bit. Whether you're a Jesus follower or not, let's say Jesus really was God, which means that virtually Jesus knew everything. He knew everything about everybody. So he could see right through your masks. And let's say Jesus really did have the power to do all of these amazing things. He could heal the sick, control the weather, cast out demons, and he could even raise the dead. So let's say Jesus could know virtually anything and could do virtually anything. Now, change it up just a bit. Let's say you could be Jesus, just for a day maybe, maybe for a week, maybe for a month. And so for that day, that week, that month, you could see through everybody's masks. You know all of our secrets, all of them. And you have the power to control the weather, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, and do pretty much anything else that you choose to do. Now, what would you do with that day or that week or that month? How would you do Jesus? And afterwards, as people were reflecting, your family, your friends, and maybe even your enemies, what would they think about what you have done? Did you do Jesus well? How would people remember you if you were Jesus. Now that's not quite where we're going. I just want you to set up getting this whole idea. What was Jesus like? What was he like? Have you ever pondered what Jesus looked like? What he looked like physically? Now all of us have these different pictures of Jesus in our minds. In fact, most of us probably grew up picturing Jesus something like this because this is the picture that was ubiquitous. It was on our walls in our homes and the walls of our churches. Jesus, gentle, peaceful, serene, white. Or maybe you picture Jesus hugging a little girl or hugging a, a lamb. Those are sweet, aren't they? We like these kinds of pictures because they're safe. They work for us. Or some people like to picture Jesus with a, with a smile on his face or maybe even laughing. This one on the left was one of my favorites growing up. And this one on the right, well, I, I just kind of hope Jesus did a whole lot of laughing. Recently, there's been kind of a, a bunch of these ripped Jesus. I, I think they're kind of funny, this CrossFit Jesus. They're kind of fun. You can just hear them, can't you? I'll be back. And there are others. I mean, some of the pics kind of surprise us, but they shouldn't. Why wouldn't blacks picture Jesus as black or orientals picture Jesus as an oriental? We Caucasians tend to picture Jesus as white, don't we? Now, this next pic is the one that may fascinate me the most. It was actually published in December 2002 in an issue of Popular Mechanics, believe it or not. Now, they reprinted this article in April of this year because it's one of their most famous stories ever. They had these forensic anthropologists reconstruct what Jesus might have actually looked like based on all of the scientific evidence they could muster, trying to reconstruct what an average carpenter might have looked like in Israel about 2,000 years ago. And here's what they came up with. About five foot one, pretty short for today. About 110 pretty thin, at least for guys like me, muscular, fit. They figure his skin was darker and weathered, making him look a little older. What do you think? You think churches would post this picture of Jesus on their walls? Doubt it. Now, what fascinates me is that we actually have no reliable information at all about what Jesus looked like, except that he looked like nothing special. None of his friends, none of his enemies chose to pass that information on to us. Apparently, that's not what captivated people about Jesus. That's not what struck them. It's not what they remembered about him. Now, we do know quite a lot about the kinds of things that he did, the healings, the exorcisms, the power over nature, his raising the dead, extra human power, supernatural power. They recorded a lot of that stuff. 
And we do know quite a lot about the kinds of things he said and about the kind of authority that he claimed. He claimed to speak with the authority of God, go figure. We have multiple accounts of Jesus' words. And we do have quite a bit of information about the kinds of people who were drawn to him and the kinds of people who hated him, which was actually kind of weird because the people who tend to push us away as Jesus followers, they kind of like Jesus. How does that work? And the religious people in that world, people like us, who they're the ones who really didn't like Jesus, go figure. It just kind of seems backwards. Bottom line, we just fixate on different questions. The question we tend to fixate on is this one. Was Jesus like God? Was Jesus God? Was Jesus really the creator God in a bod? Let's say he was. Well, then, if he really was God, was he actually human too? How would that work? How can Jesus be both 100% God and 100% man? Because it would seem like one would negate the other, wouldn't it? And, and even, though, even though those around Jesus, the historical Jesus, wanted to know that too, that doesn't seem to be what captivated their hearts. What captivated them about Jesus, what they remembered most about Jesus, what they fixated on with Jesus was the idea that he was 100% truth and 100% grace, which if you think about it is even more mind-boggling and heart-rendering than his being fully God and fully man. The Apostle John put it like this. He said, the word of God, the word of God, God became a human being. It's amazing, God and man at the same time. But John doesn't stop there. He says, and Jesus is full of grace and truth as he lived among us. And we saw his glory with our own eyes. Now, which is the harder pairing for you? For Jesus to be 100% human and 100% God at the same time, or for Jesus to be 100% truth and 100% grace at the same time? In my mind, that's even more mind-blowing. The first pairing captivates the mind. The second pairing captivated their hearts and ours. So let's go a little deeper. Jesus, was he both God and man, or was he, was he both, and, and how does that work? In a whole lot of ways, physically, Jesus just doesn't look like God. I mean, does, does that look like a picture of God to you? Jesus was so human. And you start thinking about it. Can you imagine a God, a real God who gets tired? His eyes start to droop. His head starts to nod like you do, maybe some of you guys right now. Can you imagine a God, a real God, not one of these DC or Marvel Universe gods, but a real God whose stomach would growl whenever he got hungry as if a God would need food like we do? Can you actually imagine a God with skin knees, a, a God who bleeds? Can you imagine a God who needs a shave or a bathroom, a God with a belly button? What would a real eternal God need a belly button for? And these two moments, I think, were the most deceptive of all. I think the second most deceptive moment in the life of Jesus when it's, he's covered with afterbirth drawing his first breaths, cold, helpless, crying, maybe. He said, gods aren't born, they just are. And I think the most deceptive moment is when Jesus is hanging dead on a cross because gods don't die. That seems kind of the ultimate test, doesn't it? It would seem. Wouldn't a cross prove Jesus to be a man, fully human? And yet, what man, what human could do the kind of things that Jesus did with the kind of ease with which he did them? And if the stories in the Bible are true, and there are powerful historical evidences that they are, well, Jesus would heal people simply with words. No incantations, no fancy rituals, just be healed. And they were immediately. 
He would tell the winds to hush. They would immediately. That's not human. He'd cast out demons with words. No holy water, crosses, rituals, anything like that. Just get out. And they would. Jesus raised the dead. And I'm not talking about people who were mostly dead or just recently dead. I'm talking about in the grave starting to stink dead. Humans can't do that. Then, then Jesus predicts his own death in detail, repeatedly, which isn't that big a deal. But he also predicts his own resurrection in detail, and he pulls it off. And guys, if a guy can predict his resurrection and pull it off, you might want to follow him. So the disciples come to the conclusion Jesus really is fully God, 100% God, and still fully man, 100% man too. Doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit into these tiny little brains of ours, but we're talking about God, right? And it would be crazy to think that God could fit into these tiny little brains. So what was Jesus like? Fully God, fully man, not 50, 50, 60, 40, 75, 25, 100% God, 100% man at the same time. Go figure. How amazing is that? And that awed them, that dazzled them. But it doesn't seem to be what captivated their hearts. Apostle John says this, the word of God became a human being, God became a man, God and man at the same time. Full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth at the same time he lived among us and we saw his glory with our own eyes. That was mind-blowing. A God of truth we could get. A God of grace we could get. A God of both truth and grace, 100% of each, that will rip your heart out. Now, sometimes I'm not sure that I'd like to be too close to Jesus. Because how would you like to be next to somebody who could see through every single one of your masks? Every single mask. You have, you have no secrets. We all have secrets, right? We have these things inside of us we hope others never see. Sometimes they're embarrassing. Sometimes they're awful. What would it be like to be next to someone from whom you could hide nothing? And he's not going to buy any of your excuses, any of your rationalizations. He knows you. According to the Apostle John, who probably knew Jesus better than any other man, that's how Jesus was. In fact, John says he knew them all. There was no need for anyone to tell Jesus about them because he knew what was in their hearts. The message puts it like this. John says Jesus knew them inside and out. He didn't need any help in seeing right through them. Well, that'd be hard to be around. Sometimes I like my masks. In fact, one great preacher, a guy named Haddon Robinson, used to say this. He said, if these people knew about me what you know about me, God, they wouldn't listen to a word I say. Well, me too. He knows. About 100 years ago, a guy named Rudolf Otto wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy. And he wanted to explore what it felt like to be in the actual presence of God, to sense the presence of God. Because there are stories throughout history of people who felt like they had been in the actual physical presence of God. And the stories had some things in common. You're in the presence of something supernatural, genuinely supernatural, not natural, mysterious, eerie, uncanny, a presence that rattles your bones and you sense this overwhelming power, literally overwhelming power. An ant would have a better chance stopping a bulldozer than you would have resisting this God. And you sense his holiness, absolute purity, so pure that everything impure about you is exposed in all of its ugliness. And those who experience that say it's terrifying, unmasking, 
The prophet Isaiah said he wanted to curl up into a ball and die. He says, it's over. I'm doomed. I'm a sinful man. I have unclean lips, and I live in the middle of a people with filthy lips. But I've seen the king. And yet, Rudolph Otto found something else in the stories. He said the people who had those experiences had this fascination with God. It was almost intoxicating because alongside the power and the purity, they sensed grace. They sensed his love. He loves you anyway. The all-powerful, all-holy God loves me. Rudolf Otto called it the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans, the terrifying and fascinating mystery of the presence of God. Now, you ever had a taste of that? Just the tiniest taste? I hope you have at some point in your life. Someday you will. A sense of the all-powerful, all-holy, all-gracious God. And I think some of that leaked out through Jesus. And I think that's what blew them away which is why the Apostle John, the one who knew him best, said the word of God became a human being. God became a man, fully human, fully God, and full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. He lived among us, and we saw his glory with our own eyes. God of grace, we get. A God of truth, we get. A God of both truth and grace, 100% truth, 100% grace. Well, guys, in a world that is grace-starved and truth-starved, starved. Jesus intrigues us, dazzles us, confounds us, and compels us. I mean, either one by itself would be dazzling, but for Jesus to be fully both, 100% truth, 100% grace, in my mind, it's even more mind-blowing than 100% human and 100% God. We can't pull it off on our own. People tend to be either heavy on truth and weak on grace or heavy on grace and weak on truth, right? Churches too. Churches tend to either be heavy on truth and weak on grace or heavy on grace and weak on truth. Have you ever seen a Jesus follower who's heavy on truth and light on grace? A Jesus follower who will kind of beat you over the head with Jesus if he can? The Bible is their sword of the Spirit and they just love and love stubbing, stabbing people with their sword? All judgmental like their mission from God is to call out sin it's almost like they're excited about hell for anybody who would push back do you know that Jesus followers who are strong on truth and weak on grace poison the church and they push people outside the church away from God they do on the other hand maybe you've been around Jesus followers who are heavy on grace and light on truth they try to be so loving, so sensitive, so tolerant that they struggle to call a sin, sin. And there are Jesus followers like that and churches like that. And it'll be okay. God loves you just the way you are. And he does. But their mission from God seems to be, to be tolerant of nearly anything. They refuse to call sin out, the sin that's destroying people. Listen, guys, listen. This is so important. Truth without grace is not God's truth. If you can't speak truth with grace, please just shut up. You're going to do more harm than good. You're going to drive people away from our God. And listen, grace without truth is not really grace. If someone is sinning against God, it's not grace to tell them it'll be okay. You'll become an enabler. Jesus, somehow he was 100% truth and 100% grace, and he absolutely fascinated them, which is why the kind of people who are repelled by us were actually attracted to Jesus. He never minced words. He never softened the truth, and he could see right through their masks. He knew them inside and out, and yet the people out there flocked to him. They invited him into their homes. They invited him to their parties. They would tear off a roof to get to him. Whether they were powerful or powerless, educated, those who had no use for school, the rich and the poor, the sick, the broken, those who were despised, and not because he excused their sins. He was 100% truth. 
He could see inside them and they knew it and yet they could sense grace. They could sense his love. What would it feel like to be fully known, every single secret exposed and know that you're still loved? Mysterium tremendum et fascinance. Terrifying, fascinating presence of God. Have you ever felt any of that? The word of God, God became a man, fully human, fully God, and he was full of grace and truth as he lived among us. And we saw his glory with our own eyes. 100% God, 100% truth, 100% grace, and 100% truth. So in the end, Jesus was hounded by the religious leaders. He was betrayed by a friend, forsaken by his disciples, brutalized by the police, beaten by his inquisitors, and led in disgrace to a rigged trial. There, arrogant men sat in judgment over him, they thought, crowning him with thorns and mocking him. They beat him without mercy and they nailed him to a cross, the worst death they could give him at the time. Stretching him out between two thieves, fitting, they thought. Miserably thirsty, seemingly forsaken by God, a picture of complete aloneness. Hell on earth? Huh. Not just one man's hell, but the hell of billions. At any moment, Jesus, fully God, could have called on an army of angels to deliver him and destroy his enemies. It would have only taken one. Instead, he accepted the scars of sin, rebellion, and mockery, hatred, the scars of grace. He took our scars. He took the hell we didn't deserve, we, he didn't deserve, so we could have the heaven we don't deserve. You get that? Jesus took the hell he didn't deserve so we could have the heaven we don't deserve. Guys, if you are not stunned by grace, you don't get it yet or what it cost him. And listen, guys, grace does not diminish our sin. It doesn't diminish our depravity. In fact, grace throws a spotlight on it. Grace is not about God lowering his standards. It's about his paying the price that we deserve to pay. We need real grace because we face real truth. Here's the truth, guys. We are not sick in our sins. We're dead in our sins. Jesus didn't die to make sick people well. Jesus died to enable dead people to live. The Word of God became a human being fully human, fully God, full of grace, full of truth, and he lived among us and we beheld his glory with our own eyes. What was he like? 100% God, 100% man, 100% grace, 100% truth, which is why those who push us away so often are drawn to the real Jesus. Well, so what? Two weeks ago, we talked about, why do I care? Why do you care? Why, why should those he calls us to, to reach, why should they care? I mean, it's like we're pretty obsessed with this Jesus, right? And, and it came down to this. The real Jesus made these outrageous promises, the kind of promises that if he could keep them, they'd be worth anything to be on the receiving end. Jesus said, if you follow me, I'm going to give you a way better life in this world, and I'm going to give you an infinitely better life in the next. What if? And the real Jesus made these outrageous demands. He said, you have to give up everything, everything to follow me. I have to be first in everything, which would be a ludicrous demand unless that was the path to receiving those promises, and unless, and this is the big one, you see, the real Jesus made the most outrageous claim conceivable. He claimed to be God, the real God, the only God, the creator God. What if it's true? What if Jesus really is God so he can really keep his promises, a way better life in this world and an infinitely better life in the next? Well, guys, we believe it. We 
care because we need Jesus and you need Jesus and they need Jesus. That, that was two weeks ago. Last week was, why did he come? Why did God become a man? Why did Jesus come? Why would he take the form of one of us and actually let us kill him? Why would the all-powerful creator God go that low, even to die for the likes of you and me? And it all boiled down to this. What if? What if God doesn't see you? What if he doesn't see us just as his creatures? What if the God of the universe actually sees us as his kids? What if God loves you as much as you love your kids and your grandkids, which is stupid because God actually loves his kids way more than we do. I mean, every parent, every grandparent wants to protect our kids. We want to rescue them if they're in trouble. We'd like to think that we would risk our lives to save our kids, right? Well, our dad, our Abba, saw us, his kids, in trouble. We may not see it yet, but he sees it. What great dad wouldn't die to protect or to rescue or to save his kids if that's what it took? That's why Jesus came. This week is about, what was he like? Well, he was like 100% God and 100% human, go figure. Put those things together. And 100% truth and 100% grace, even harder to comprehend, I think. But guys, how will this change who you are and how you live as a Jesus follower? Well, it means that we need to take Jesus seriously. If Jesus was just a man, just a man, it wouldn't matter if you blew him off or simply reshaped him into whatever kind of a fantasy God that you want to follow. But if Jesus really was 100% God, we better be ready to follow him anywhere. But Jesus is not only God and man, he's also grace and truth. And guys, that'll change what doing life with God, for God, God's way feels like. How will it feel to be fully known, no masks, no secrets, and know that God loves you anyway? If that doesn't blow your socks off, you don't get it yet. We can walk out of this place with this peace with God that is inexplicable. You can walk out of this place with a profound hope, expectation of heaven. You can walk out of here with a joy and a strength that makes no sense in a time when our world is an absolute mess. You can walk out of here with the guilt and the shame that you've been toting around, the guilt and the shame that have been crushing you. You can walk out of here forgiven, free. It's not just about a truth that we embrace. It's about grace and truth. But there's still more, because here's the deal. If we let him, if we cooperate, God is going to try to morph us into the image of his son. I'm not talking about his physical image. He's not going to try to make us look like this guy. No. God's in you to shape your character, your heart, so that you're more like him, full of truth and grace. He wants to fill you with a sense of purpose. He wants to give you clarity about what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's not. He wants you to love each other and to love them with the kind of love that he showed us. How are you doing with truth and grace? Never compromising on God's truth, but never speaking God's truth without his grace. Because here's the deal, guys. If you want to know what God is like, look hard at Jesus. That's why he came, to show us who God is and what he's about. But if people out there want to know what Jesus was like, they should get a glimpse of him by looking at us, which is why we have to let God morph us into the image of Christ to be the kind of people that we were meant to be. Guys, if we fail the truth test, we fail to be Christ-like. If we fail the grace test, we fail to be Christ-like too. And in our grace-starved, truth-starved world that needs Jesus, they need us to be Jesus' followers. They need us to be the church. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your truth.
give us the courage to let you shape us into what you meant us to be. Help us to live the life you meant us to live and to do the job that you gave us to do. We love you dearly. In the name of Christ, we pray these things. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine above. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you
few things to share with you this morning as we close. Um, number one, a big thanks to Steve again for filling in this week and continuing the series that we've been in. Find some conclusion there. Um, second, please pray for our staff, um, for their health, their well-being. Um, if you know our guys and gals, resting is not easy. Um, it's not easy to um, give control over to others and to allow themselves to heal. So pray for them. Number three, um, encounter this evening has been postponed until we have health and can feel safe gathering. Um, before you go, if you don't mind indulging me for a moment, each week when we have offering, um, well, many weeks, the phrase thrown around is when you give, lives are changed. And um, selfishly, I want to share my vantage point that um, the school I work in and the kids I see and the lives changed there. Um, many things I think back on, I think of a, after a ball game one, one day last year, um, catching up with a former student who said, I was at your church last week because my sister was baptized Sunday night at Quest to um, a suffering a tragic loss last year and seeing the breakout leaders, the adults who volunteer on Sunday and Wednesday nights with our kids come in and be spiritual mentors to our kids and guide them through rough waters. Um, to the number of kids stepping up this year. Um, with COVID, we have more lunch periods than we've ever had and kids stepping up and saying, we wanna continue to meet with FCA. We know you're not in your room at my lunch time, but can we still meet anyway? Um, when you give, lives are changed because you know those kids that they come needing relationship, they come needing the Lord, um, but they don't come with a full pocketbook. They can't support those ministries. So thank you for supporting those and letting me be a witness to see what happens to those lives as they change. I would challenge you. I don't know what piece, <clears throat> what piece of the sermon you grabbed today. Um, but for me, the being seen through your mask and having somebody sitting beside you still loving you. And I know in my world of school and especially in our world as community that sitting along somebody that we see them fully and we can still express that love, it's greatly needed at this time. I challenge you to go out and be that blessing. Have a wonderful week.